Good morning. We greet you this morning in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We welcome you to the Lord's house as uh, we begin the Lord's day together in worship. Uh, we have a, a full slate of announcements to make. I'm going to try and cut them way down, uh, but I can't cut them all down. And so I do want to encourage you to look in the back of your bulletin so that you get a handle on the things that are upcoming in the life of the church. We're still in those busy uh, summer months with a lot of things happening, uh, and there are things upcoming for the fall that you want to get on your calendar as well. Uh, let me start with just this week with a mommy and me uh, that was scheduled um, uh, for 10 a.m. That is now taking place in, in Century Park in Greer. Uh, so don't show up at the Wade's house. Show up at Century Park for that. Again, that'll be 10 a.m. tomorrow morning. Uh, Men at the Gates happens at the regular time with Pastor Dodds at 6.15 a.m. on uh, Tuesday. Uh, also happening Tuesday night. This was back on the menu, literally, is the Low Country Boil. Um, and uh, that's going to be happening here uh, at the church in the Fellowship Hall at, um, at 6 p.m. on Tuesday evening. Uh, Wednesday will be a regular night at church with all the regular activities, but it also includes King's Kids being back on at 4 p.m. Uh, youth, children, and adult will be meeting for uh, prayer. Um, the, uh, the high schoolers will be joining with the adults in the prayer meeting. Uh, and then uh, there will be no middle school class. Anyone's left over from that. Um, then you are welcome to go in with the adult prayer meeting as well. Um, not that you're leftovers, you're important to us, but most everyone is going to Ridge Haven uh, this week for our middle school camp. We're taking 45 uh, uh, to that camp, uh, joining with about 300 other uh, young people from around the southeast. And I do want to encourage you to pray for, for those that are part of that. Uh, for those who are going on that trip, parents, make sure that the students are at the church at 12 p.m. They don't have to be there before 12 p.m., just be there at 12 p.m., uh, and the bus will begin to load at that time, and, and Pastor King will be seeing the crew off um, uh, departing the church at 1230. But don't, you, just forget you heard 1230, show up at 12. Uh, ladies' discipleship training will happen Thursday at the regular time. Uh, uh, also, um, on Friday evening, there will be a meet and greet with Erica Zabo. Um, that is going to happen at 6 p.m. at the Skellinger residence, not too far from the church here. Uh, there is a sign-up for that. That sign-up is available in the, nar in the narthex back of the visitor's uh, kiosk. And so if you wouldn't mind stopping there, uh, sign up no later than Tuesday. So there can be a good head count uh, for, for attending uh, that meet and greet with, with uh, Erica. And then other things you want to be aware of, there's a, a father-daughter camp out scheduled for October 6th through 7th. Um, an email has gone out for that, but you need to sign up right away for that uh, because we have slots that are reserved and, if, and we have to pay uh, to keep those slots. And so we need to know who's coming uh, uh, right away. Uh, next Sunday, there'll be a fifth Sunday lunch. Uh, you know, those have become uh, very large scale events uh, in recent days, which is wonderful. Praise the Lord for that. Uh, your part in that is that we will have no classic fellowship next Sunday morning. And so you'll go directly from worship to Sunday school. Uh, we'll begin to meet early for, uh, for that lunch. And as part of that, you need to bring a main dish and either a side or a dessert uh, for that meal. Bring that in to the kitchen uh, in the, before the, morning, the start of the morning worship service. Um, uh, bring it ready to serve, and they'll do what they need to do with it in the meantime. So uh, that would be vital for us. Uh, just as a body of Christ, we always need to be reminded that, that we have to do two things at once. We need to weep with those who weep and rejoice with those who rejoice, as we're commanded to do. Uh, by the Apostle Paul in the book of Romans. And today is the day for mourning. You may have seen the email that Mrs. Jackie Ware has passed. That's the, the wife of uh, Bob Ware. Uh, she died this past Thursday. Uh, she had been declining for a number of years. She was 84 years old. Uh, and they, they have been a, a precious uh, couple and a precious love uh, displayed by, um, uh, by uh, Bob Ware in that. And so, uh, so mourn with them, and we'll give details ahead on the services, and then also we rejoice. Uh, you may have seen the email. This is one for a special, huge rejoicing, uh, is the celebration for Robert and Jesse Ewing, the birth of their son, Henry Robert Ewing, uh, 21 inches long and 10 pounds. So double digits, um, Henry Robert. So we're gonna celebrate with them. Uh, if you're a visitor with us this morning, we're delighted that you're worshiping here at Woodruff Road. Uh, we'd love to get to know you better. If you can do a few things for us this morning, in, in front of you in the pew rack, there's a blue visitor information card. Uh, now's a great time to fill that out, and you can either drop that in the offering plate. Uh, you can find one of the pastors after the service and hand that to us and introduce yourself. Don't just hand us a blue card and run away. Uh, we'd like to talk to you, uh, and then we'd invite you to come and join us for fellowship. There will be a crowd that rushes out the door down the hallway to the right. Uh, follow them, and there will be fellowship uh, waiting for you there. 
Uh, and then stick around for Sunday school. We have two offerings today. We continue. This is the fourth of five in our J-term series. Uh, let me just confuse you a little bit on that. Uh, we're going to flip-flop rooms this morning for the adult Sunday school classes. And so the uh, Christian parenting or uh, Christian families and technology will be here in the sanctuary. Uh, and then the uh, class with Pastor Dodds on issues and biblical counseling will move to the choir room. So everybody's switching. Uh, don't be confused on that this morning uh, when we go there. And if you're a visitor, we'd love to have you join us for that class. Uh, if you have children, elementary age children will be going to the youth room, which is down the hallway to the right, uh, and, uh, for, for Sunday school there. A um, couple of other things, we're, we're so close, um, is the ice cream social for the uh, youth. The senior high happens tonight at the home of Paul and Michelle Thompson. Uh, just around the corner. Uh, there is extra parking at their clubhouse if you can't find parking in front of the house. So Thompson's wanted us to pass that on. Um, I believe that actually concludes our announcements for this morning. You did a good job hanging in there. Uh, let's now direct our hearts towards the reason that we are here this morning, and that is to come to the worship of the triune and living God. This morning we come into the presence of Christ who is our prophet, as our priest, and as our king. We're reminded as a prophet that he will speak to us through the reading and preaching of the word of God. As our priest, he will assure us of the forgiveness of our sins as we confess them before them. And you'll see it demonstrated as well, his priestly work and the baptism that takes place later in the service. And then also as our king, he will receive your offerings, the tributes that you bring, and he will lay claim to your obedience. It is right and good for him to lay hold of all these things and to be all these things for us. And so come this morning embracing Christ in your worship. Hear now as God calls you by his own word into his worship from Psalm 66. Make a joyful shout to God all the earth. Sing out the honor of his name. Make his praise glorious. Say to God how awesome are your works. Through the greatness of your power your enemies shall submit themselves to you. All the earth shall worship you and sing praises to you. They shall sing praises to your name. Let's now join with all the earth by taking our Trinity Psalter hymnals. We'll turn to hymn number 253 and stand together and sing, God, all nature sings thy glory, hymn 253.
Perhaps you noticed in the words you just sang in the third verse, it says, but our sins have spoiled thy image, nature, conscience, only service, unceasing grim reminders of the wrath which we deserve. We're called to confess our sins by the word of God from Numbers 5, 6, and 7, where we read, Speak to the children of Israel when a man or a woman commits any sin that men commit in unfaithfulness against the Lord, and that person is guilty. Then he shall confess the sin which he has committed. He shall make restitution for his trespass in full, plus one-fifth of it, and give it to the one he has wronged. It's right for us who have been unfaithful to God to now confess our sins before him. We'll do so using the form that's printed in your bulletin. Almighty and holy God, we confess before you that we are poor sinners, we are wanting to be the We ha- there has been a fifth added to our confession, our restitution. It's not added by us, it's added by Christ. And so we're reminded in the assurance of pardon from Colossians 1, 13 and 14, He has delivered us from the power of darkness and con- conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. Amen. standing and take your Bibles and turn with me for our Old Testament reading to Leviticus chapter 16. Leviticus chapter 16 is that gospel presentation in the Old Testament in the center book of the Pentateuch and the center chapter of the book of Leviticus. We find this gospel picture. So hear now the word of God and please respond appropriately as it's printed in your bulletin. Now the Lord spoke to Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron when they offered profane fire before the Lord and died. And the Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron your brother not to come at just any time into the holy place inside the veil before the mercy seat, which is on the ark, lest he die. For I will appear in the cloud above the mercy seat. Thus Aaron shall come into the holy place with the blood of a young bull as a sin offering and of a ram as a burnt offering. He shall put the holy linen tunic and the linen trousers on his body. He shall be girded with a linen sash and with the linen turban he shall be attired. These are holy garments. Therefore he shall wash his body in water and put them on, and he shall take from the congregation of the children of Israel two kids of the goats as a sin offering and one ram as a burnt offering. Aaron shall offer the bull as a sin offering, which is for himself, and make atonement for himself and for his house. He shall take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of meeting. And Aaron shall cast lots for the the two goats, one lot for for the Lord and the other lot for the scapegoat. And Aaron shall bring the goat on which the Lord's lot fell and offer it as a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make atonement upon it and to let it go as the scapegoat into the wilderness. And Aaron shall bring the bull of the sin offering which is for himself and make atonement for himself and for his house and shall kill the bull as the sin offering which is for himself. Then he shall take a censer full of burning coals of fire from the altar before the Lord with his hands full of sweet incense beaten fine and bring it inside the veil. 
And he shall put the incense on the fire before the Lord, that the cloud of incense may cover the mercy seat that is on the testimony, lest he die. He shall take some of the blood of the bull and sprinkle it with his finger on the mercy seat on the east side. And before the mercy seat, he shall sprinkle some of the blood with his finger seven times. Then he shall kill the goat of the sin offering, which is for the people. Bring its blood inside the veil to do with that blood as he did with the blood of the bull and sprinkle it on the mercy seat and before the mercy seat. So he shall make atonement for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the children of Israel and because of their transgressions for all their sins. And so he shall do for the tabernacle of meeting which remains among them in the midst of their uncleanness. There shall be no man in the tabernacle of meeting when he goes in to make atonement in the holy place until he comes out that he may make atonement for himself, for his household, and for all the assembly of Israel. And he shall go out to the altar that is before the Lord and make atonement for it, and shall take some of the blood of the bull and some of the blood of the goat and put it on the horns of the altar all around. Then he shall sprinkle some of the blood on it with his finger seven times, cleanse it, and consecrate it from the uncleanness of the children of Israel. And when he has made an end of atoning for the holy place, the tabernacle of meeting and the altar, he shall bring the live goat. Aaron shall lay both his hands on the head of the live goat, confess over it all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions concerning all their sins, putting them on the head of the goat, and shall send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a suitable man. The goat shall bear on itself all their iniquities to an uninhabited land, and he shall release the goat in the wilderness. Then Aaron shall come into the tabernacle of meeting, shall take off the linen garments which he put on when he went into the holy place, and shall leave them there. And he shall wash his body with water in a holy place, put on his garments, and come out and offer his burnt offering and the burnt offering of the people, and make atonement for himself and for the people. The fat of the sin offering he shall burn on the altar, and he who released the goat as a scapegoat shall wash his clothes and bathe his body in water, and afterward he may come into the camp. The bull for the sin offering and the goat for the sin offering, whose blood was brought in to make atonement in the holy place, shall be carried outside the camp. And they shall burn in the fire their skins, their flesh, and their offal. Then he who burns them shall wash his clothes and bathe his body in water, and afterward he may come into the camp. This shall be a statute forever for you. In the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, you shall afflict your souls and do no work at all, whether a native of your own country or a stranger who dwells among you. For on that day the priest shall make atonement for you to cleanse you, that you may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. It is a Sabbath of solemn rest for you, and you shall afflict your your souls. It is a statute forever. And the priest who is anointed and consecrated to minister as priest in his father's place shall make atonement and put on the linen clothes, the holy garments. Then he shall make atonement for the holy sanctuary, and he shall make atonement for the tabernacle of meeting and for the altar, and he shall make atonement for the priests and for all the people of the assembly. This shall be an everlasting statute for you, to make atonement for the children of Israel for all their sins once a year. And he did as the Lord commanded Moses. The grass withers and the flower fades. You may be seated. This morning we have the privilege of receiving into the congregation a covenant child, River Charles Lane, who is the son of Stephen and Emily Rose Lane. We're going to ask them all to come down front along with ruling elder Frederick Marsenak, who's our shepherding elder. He's a very verbal young man. Had the privilege of dining with him the other night. He talked to me the whole time, or singing. It was hard to say which it was. Uh, Both were good. Uh, You also see in front of you uh, Isabel and Arrow and Wilder. Um, uh, and, uh, and now we have River as well, and so, so a, a daughter and three sons. And it's right for us to, to go back and to remind ourselves of exactly what it is that we're doing, that this is not just a, a tradition that we have in the Presbyterian Church. Hello. Hi. I'm very glad to see you. Uh, uh, this is, is not just a ritual that we do. This is a sacrament that has been appointed by our Lord Jesus Christ. And we need to remind ourselves of the meaning of what's taking place. The first thing that you see in the sacrament is that there is a need. As cute as River is, 
He is also born and afflicted with a condition from his birth, and that condition is sin. He is tainted not only by his parents, but by his father Adam, who sinned before him and caused that sin to come to him and to him to suffer the consequences of that sin. All the sin and fall short of the glory of God. That includes river as well. And he needs the cleansing work of Christ. The second thing is that by the sacrament, there is a reality that is declared, and that is the virtue of his standing in the church. In Ezekiel 16, there's a horrific chapter with the people of God. And there the prophet, speaking for the Lord, condemns what the people have done. He says, Moreover, you took your sons and daughters whom you bore to me, and these you sacrificed to them to be devoured. Were your acts of harlotry a small matter that you have slain my children? The Lord declares his ownership of our children from the very beginning, that they are his. The sign points to that. Paul says it more positively in the New Testament. He says the child of even one believing parent is considered holy. And the Apostle Peter, when he preached on the day of Pentecost, he said that everyone is to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit and the promise is to you and to your children. And so this declaration of, of, that's in baptism is the reality that river belongs to Christ. And finally, there is a gospel proclamation and a hope in this sacrament. Not, not mere wishfulness, but a confidence in the cleansing work of, of Christ. Stephen and Emily Rose bring river. They are obliged to bring river up in the fear and admonition of the Lord. It's their obligation to which they are committed. And they're going to pray with him. They're going to pray desperately for him in days to come. Some days it will be obvious how much he needs the prayer. Some days not so obvious. And that's why they commit themselves to that. And the prayer is that they would know, they, that, that River would grow up knowing Christ the way that Timothy did. As Paul writes in 2 Timothy 3, But you must continue in the things which you have learned and been assured of, knowing from whom you have learned them, and that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. So Stephen Emily Rose, acting in faith this day, you're bringing your child for baptism. It's right for you to state those vows publicly before the congregation, what you are committing yourselves to uh, in this rite. So let me ask you those questions. First, do you acknowledge River's need of the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ and the renewing grace of the Holy Spirit? Do you claim God's promise, covenant promise in his behalf and do you look in faith to the Lord Jesus Christ for his salvation as you do for your own? And finally, do you now unreservedly dedicate river to God and promise in humble reliance upon divine grace that you will endeavor to set before him a godly example, that you will pray with and for him, that you will teach him the doctrines of our holy religion, and that you will strive by all the means of God's appointment to bring him up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord? It's also right for you as a congregation to have uh, a part to play in this. They don't do this by themselves. They do it in the community of the church. And so if you are a communing member of this church, let me ask you to stand also to take vows. Please respond by saying we will. Do you as communing members of this congregation undertake the responsibility of assisting Stephen and Emily Rose in the Christian nurture of River? Please be seated. Now, I'm going to step out of the way and give Pastor Robbins the easy part. And he stopped singing. Every time we have a baptism, typically whatever pastor is leading that day does the baptism. And so I sent a note to Stephen a few weeks ago, and I said, your choice, uh, no, no uh, right of ownership over this. So you can have Pastor King or Pastor Dodds or Pastor Anderson or myself and so he said, well, what should I do? I said, well, Pastor Anderson and I both are, are leading worship that day. He said, could I have both? <laughs> so young R.C., as we've already started to call him, um, he, he gets two pastors. I'm waiting for someone who asked for three. Um, <laughs> River Charles Lane, son of believing parents, grandson of believing parents, heir of all the promises of God's covenant of grace. I baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our Father, we thank you for young River Charles, how he has already proven once again to be a gift to his parents, that you have opened the womb and shown your kindness to Stephen and Emily Rose. But Lord, we pray for him now, 
We would pray that as he grows up, he would not ever remember a day when he wasn't trusting in Christ alone for a Savior. And so we pray that he would love his siblings, he would love the church, but most especially that he would love the Lord Jesus Christ, who is his only hope. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. River Charles Lane, welcome to the household of faith. Psalm 28.6, we are told, or Proverbs 28.6, we're told by Solomon, better is a poor man with integrity than a rich man who is crooked in his ways. The integrity that Solomon speaks of there is not so much about honesty, though that's, that's inherent in that statement, but it's about completeness or perfection. It's about living blamelessly before the Lord. To live blamelessly before the Lord begins in the heart, and so there's a right way to give where we give not reluctantly or, or under compulsion, but we give willingly to the Lord because we love the Lord and we love his honor. So let us give now in that sense. Let's pray together. Oh Lord God, we pray that you would indeed allow us to give to you this day in integrity. That it would be the reality, Lord, that this is something that we gladly do because we rejoice to glorify so great a God as you. We desire to see you be exalted, your gospel be proclaimed. Lord, use your spirit now to work good with, in our hearts as we give and from what is given to work much good for our world. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.
Join with me now as we exercise that privilege of God's people purchased for us by Christ, our mediator. Let's pray together. Well, Lord our God, you are great and awesome. We come to you this morning confessing your greatness and your glory. You are the triune, living, and eternal God, holy, 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 unrivaled and incomparable in all your works, showing us your greatness by your mighty hand. What power is there in heaven and earth that is like yours? Who can do anything like your mighty works and mighty deeds? Lord God, they are all marvelous. Your enemies fall before you. Your people are upheld. You are a refuge for those who are oppressed and an ever-present help in time of trouble. We confess that all judgment is yours from now and for eternity and that there is none who can prevail over your wisdom or your justice. Lord, you, Lord God, you create and you destroy. You raise up and you tear down. You build and you overthrow. All power is yours to do all your holy will. And we praise you, O God, as our privilege, for you have, by your own choice, your condescension, revealed yourself to us. You have granted us your word to know you as you are. You have allowed us to know you not only as our God, but also as our Redeemer. We bless you for your blessing, and we love you for your love. You, O Lord, are a God who is beyond all praising. And so we bless you this day that you have not remembered our sins against us. That though there are many to you, we are clean and we are holy and we are righteous. Not because of what we've done in ourselves, but because of what your son has done for us and in our place. We have life because you are full of grace. And we are able to give to you only what you have first given to us. And what should we give to you for all the benefits you've shown us? You are a God who is gracious and righteous and merciful. And you preserve the simple and those who are low. And you give rest to weary souls And you deal bountifully with us. Lord God, you alone have delivered our souls from death, and so we praise you. We confess our dependence upon you, and we continue to come to you, looking to you for that which you alone are able to give. Lord, we do ask you this day that by your spirit you would lead us to hate evil and to cling to what is good. We ask you that you would direct us away from ourselves and toward honoring one another. We pray, Father, that you would replace our lethargy and sloth and complacency with a fervency of spirit, that we would stop serving ourselves, that we might serve you, our Lord. We ask you, O Lord, that you would teach us by trials and afflictions, during worry and grief, to rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. We pray that we would be granted patience in those tribulations and constancy in our prayers. We ask, O Lord, that as you give to us that we might give to others, that we would meet needs within the church and show kindness to strangers as well. We ask, O Lord, that you would continue to be for us greater in us than the one who is in the world, that we might be able to bless those who persecute us rather than curse them. And pray, Father, that among us there would be compassion throughout all our membership, that we would rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep, that we would be so filled with your Spirit that we might have unity that can only come by the Spirit, to live in harmony with one another, to live among each other with all humility and service and holy affection. And pray, O oh Lord, that it would be your will and your Spirit's work within us to keep us from arrogance and pride, from being wise in our own eyes, and that we would continue to hate evil and to fear you. Lord, we do ask you that you would grow your kingdom, that you would vanquish your foes, that you would exalt your Son by his victories, not only among us, but in all the world that the lost would fall in their lostness and be be crushed in the rock of Christ, that they might embrace him and find him as their savior. We pray, Father, that you would bless the preaching from this church, that you would make a gospel proclamation clear from this pulpit, but not only here, but from all your ministers and missionaries sent out from this church, even throughout our presbytery this day, that you would stir up the pastors to preach your truth with conviction, with earnestness, and with the help of the Spirit, and all your people in this region might believe and be persuaded by the truth that's proclaimed. Pray, Father, the result will be those who are disciples in this world, and going out into all the world. Lord, we ask that you would preserve your church and prosper it in every way. And we ask you, Lord, to be near your people this week, and are going out and are coming in to be present with us so as to bless us. Be in our thoughts that we might praise and thank you and submit to you and glorify you throughout our days Lord, especially we pray that you would be with those who are attending 
the middle school camp this week, those from this church and those who are joining them at Bridge Haven, that your spirit would go before. Bless the preaching of Pastor Jim McCarthy as he brings the word. Bless those who hear that they might be able to believe what they hear and believe the proclamation of Christ. The discipleship may be begun and grown because of this week. Pray that there would be an obedience in the faith, that which is once for all delivered to the saints. Or indeed, from this pulpit on this day, we pray that you would as well bless the teaching and preaching of your word to the end, that Christ would be exalted among us both now and the seasons ahead for your church. We pray all these things in the matchless name of Christ. Amen. Continue to submit ourselves to our Lord by taking our Bibles and turning for our New Testament reading to 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 21 to 25. Once again, we'll stand to give honor to the reading of God's word. 1 Peter chapter 2, beginning in verse 21. For to this you were called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps, who committed no sin, nor was deceit found in his mouth, who, when he was reviled, did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but committed himself to him who judges righteously, who himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, having died to sins, might live for righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. For you were like sheep going astray, but now, but have now returned to your shepherd and overseer of your souls. This is the word of the Lord. So you remain standing, take your Trinity Psalters again and turn with me to Psalm 32b. We'll remain standing to sing, How Blessed Is He Who's Trespassed. That's Psalm 32b.
We sing about the atonement often, but I fear that we frequently sing things thoughtlessly. Think about these things that we sing, amazing assertions about the atonement. For example, when we sing that glorious hymn that this congregation loves so much, Jesus, thy blood and righteousness, we sing these words. Jesus, be endless praise to thee whose boundless mercy hath for me a full atonement made an everlasting ransom paid. Or think of that hymn that we delight in so much usually around communion. Man of sorrows, what a name. When we sing, guilty, vile, and helpless we, spotless lamb of God was he. Full atonement. Full atonement. Can it be? Hallelujah, what a savior. And by confessing we believe in a full and final atonement of Christ, we're saying that Jesus bore the penalty for every one of my sins, past, present, and future. We're condemning the doctrine that says, I still need to atone for or pay for some of my sins in purgatory. Well, think of another one of our favorite hymns, To God Be the Glory. To God be the glory, great things he has done, so loved he the world that he gave us his son, who yielded his life an atonement for sin and open the life gate that we may go in. These hymns are simply faithfully repeating the teachings of Scripture. Teachings like that in 1 Corinthians 15, when Paul says, I'm going to tell you what the gospel is. Christ died for our sins. Or 2 Corinthians 5, where Paul writes, God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us. This morning, I want to encourage you, to look at 1 Peter 2, the passage that Pastor Anderson just read in your hearing, but we're going to only look at verse 24 this morning. And I want you to carefully digest what we hear as we expound the Apostle Peter's teaching. I rarely say this, but I'll say it today. As you hear today, your eternal life is at stake. The Apostle is going to clearly set forth what a man must believe in order to be saved. If you came here today with any confusion or doubt, Pay careful attention, because what we're going to look at is the gospel, nothing less. What we're going to look at is the penal substitutionary atonement of Jesus Christ. This is the gospel. Let's pray and seek the Lord's help now. Sovereign Lord, because of the blinding effects of sin, we can stare glorious truth in the face and not get its meaning unless you graciously open our eyes and our understanding. Have mercy on us this morning, O God. Don't leave us to our own understanding, but let in the light of your truth, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. The necessity of the atonement is taught in the scriptures from the very earliest portion. In Genesis chapter 3, as soon as Adam and Eve sin, the Lord slays an animal. Its blood is shed to cover Adam and Eve. Now notice all the elements that are present in that very first atoning act. God supplies the atoning sacrifice. God initiates the transaction. A sacrifice must die and its blood be spilt since sin has taken place. And I would remind you that when you look at that that atoning lamb in Genesis 3, the very first blood that was ever shed on this earth, was that of an atoning sacrifice. The first death that ever took place was a foreshadowing of the Lord Jesus Christ and his death to atone for sinners. But that's not the only place in the Old Testament where we hear about the atonement. In Leviticus chapter 1, as the manual for the worship of God's people opens, what is the first concern? Leviticus 1 begins with clear laws for atoning sacrifices. And we're told there that the The sacrifice of a spotless lamb is a sweet aroma to the Lord. He delights in it. And then we're told that most important detail in Leviticus 5. We hear those marvelous words, after the atoning sacrifice is slain, we hear, it shall now be forgiven him. We're told in Leviticus 9 that atonement must be made for priests and people alike because all are sinners in need of a sacrifice. But then we come to that most important text, 
several hundreds of years before the Lord Jesus takes flesh that teaches us about the atonement. I would ask you to turn there, Isaiah 53, which is the principal Old Testament text, perhaps along with the one that Pastor Anderson read a moment ago, Leviticus 16, the Day of Atonement. But Isaiah 53 goes in great depth. If we didn't have a New Testament, we would still know everything we need to know about atonement just from Isaiah 53. And so look at Isaiah 53, and let me remind you, for example, in verse 5 and 6, this speaks of the sinner's guilt being imputed to Christ and graphically stating that Christ will be punished, smitten, afflicted, wounded, bruised. And then look at verse 8 and 9. It states that Christ was punished for other people's sins, and he himself was innocent of any wrongdoing. Or look at verse 10 of Isaiah 53 that underscores the fact that it was God the Father who exacted the penalty for sin. Or verse 11, which highlights the principle of penal substitution. Speaking prophetically of Jesus, he shall bear their iniquities. So when Peter writes these words, keep one finger there in Isaiah 53 because you'll need to, but back in our text in 1 Peter 2, 24, when Peter begins to write about the atonement, Peter, as an Old Testament Jew, all he had, Genesis, Leviticus, Isaiah, the Old Testament, he had been deeply immersed in the concept and the practice of penal substitutionary atonement. Now look carefully at these words. As I said, we're going to dwell on this one verse because this one verse contains the gospel, the good news of penal substitutionary atonement. First of all, we're told who the sacrifice is. Peter tells us who himself, who's the himself they're referring to? There's no misunderstanding. Peter is speaking of the man, Jesus of Nazareth. Peter is speaking as an eyewitness of this event in human history. He's speaking of God the Son, the one who's taken flesh. And what he's going to tell us is this man, referred to as himself in verse 24, voluntarily, that in itself is staggering voluntarily lays down his life in the greatest act of sacrificial love ever. I'll say this over and over again. The sufferings of Christ were voluntary. This, for example, was prophesied in Isaiah chapter 50 when prophetically we hear these words from Jesus. I gave my back to those who struck me. I gave my cheeks to those who plucked out my beard. And I did not hide my face from shame and spitting. What Isaiah is prophesying there is the the thoughts and the words of Jesus that he offers himself voluntarily to be the sacrifice. By the way, Jesus knew exactly what sufferings awaited him. He could have easily avoided it or opted out. He knew what lay ahead. That's why in Matthew 26, as he heads towards the cross, we read these words. He began to be sorrowful and deeply distressed. Jesus even states that he could have called more than 12 legions of angels to his assistance at the moment of his arrest. Why didn't he? Because he was voluntarily going to the cross. That's why Jesus could say these astounding words in John 10. I lay down my life. I lay down my life that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. Now, there's a couple of important modifiers of this word atonement. One is substitutionary atonement. Look at verse 24, 1 Peter, where Peter says in 1 Peter 2, who himself bore our sins. That's you and I. And what we're reading here is of a substitute. When Jesus was dying, it was not for any of his own sins. He was making a substitutionary atonement. Jesus, the innocent one, the sinless one, the holy one, the voluntary one, becomes the substitute for the wicked, the guilty. Isaiah 53 prophesied this 700 years before the work of Jesus. Listen to these words and what the repeated emphasis on. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. 
This was, of course, what was being pictured by the entire sacrificial system of the Old Testament. Sheep and goats, cattle and oxen, and even for the very poor, doves and pigeons. To impress upon our Old Covenant forebears the seriousness of sin, the Lord required that the person offering that substitute for his sin lay his hands on that animal to symbolize that it stood in for him as his substitute. So if you're bringing a spotless lamb or even a dove, you had to put your hand on their head, symbolizing the transfer of your guilt to them. Also, the person making the sacrifice had to then kill the animal, which is usually done by slitting the throat with a very sharp knife. Listen to these words in Leviticus 1, the, the law of the offerer. He shall put his hand on the head of the burnt offering. It will be accepted then on his behalf to make atonement for him. Then he shall kill the bull before the Lord. No one, you see, could bring a lamb or a goat or an ox or even a dove or a pigeon unless they were willing to state, I am a sinner. On a regular basis here, it's kind of entertaining even at times when we'll have folks who will come here and I've had people sort of get up in my face. One time I thought a guy was going to poke me in the nose right there in the narthex. And they said, well, I really enjoyed this service, but I didn't like that part about the confession of sin because, you see, I'm not a sinner. And I didn't need to do it, so I just want to let you know I was quiet then. I didn't confess any sins. But, Carl, it looks to me like you have a really wretched congregation because it looked to me like all of the rest of them were confessing sins. So I'm glad they're here because they need a preacher. But I didn't partake of that. You could not be an Old Testament Jew and say that because every time you brought a, a sacrifice, it was a substitute for your sin. Anyone who would receive the benefits of forgiveness and reconciliation with God had to acknowledge, name, confess, and repent of their sin. But the second modifier, not only is this atoning work a substitutionary atonement, it's a penal substitutionary atonement. Look at what we're told in 1 Peter 2.24. We're told, who himself, here comes the key word, bore, carried, endured our sins. Now, the word penal means punishment. A penitentiary is where one goes to be punished, not rehabilitated. The essence of Christ's atoning work is in his suffering the penalty. God's law and justice requires that sinners suffer and die. But Christ satisfied the penal obligation of the law for you by his sufferings. Jesus' sufferings delivered his people from paying for their own sin in hell for eternity. His sufferings procured the non-infliction of suffering upon the elect. All the suffering that Jesus endured from his birth until his death were vicarious. Jesus was born without sin, never committed sin. Therefore, every bit of suffering he endured was undeserved. His suffering was in our behalf. And in our place, every moment of pain, every bit of anguish, every second of agony, every tear of grief, every drop of blood was born for you. Christ the innocent, suffering in the place of the guilty. Although all of Christ's suffering was vicarious or substitutionary, the scriptures place a special emphasis on the the last days of Jesus' life. At the Last Supper, do you remember what Jesus said to his disciples in that upper room? He said, with fervent desire, I've desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Christ was aware that he was about to drink the full concentration, the full cup of God's holy wrath against sin. He knew that he was giving his life as a ransom for many that he, the sinless one, was about to be made sin, the object of God's wrath. Look where this payment, this payment of a penalty took place. Look at verse 24 again. We read, he bore our sins in his own body 
on the tree. This is speaking of the wooden cross on the hill outside of Jerusalem. Everyone knew this place, Golgotha, Calvary, was a cursed place, an accursed event and mode of death. We have known since Deuteronomy 21, cursed is everyone who hangs on a cross. But one of our dilemmas, you and I, is that we really don't believe that our sins are worthy of the death penalty. We can't seem to grasp that God in his perfect holiness can't even look upon our sin. We don't really believe that if we die without having our sins cleansed, then we are lost for all eternity. Old covenant believers understood this better than we. They spent large amounts of money. Do you know how much a sacrificial oxen or bull or cow or lamb cost? Time and effort bringing many sacrifices to the temple. They did this year after year. They were so concerned about the gravity of their sin, they would do anything to have the penalty paid by a substitute. All their lives, these old covenant believers kept up the ritual of sacrifices. They did this as they wanted their sin dealt with. But they also realized, the writer of Hebrews tells us in Hebrews 10, that their sacrifices of bulls and goats weren't a permanent answer to the problem of their sin. So the good news of this text, look at the word in verse 24. When Jesus was suffering on the tree, he bore our sins. That's what Isaiah prophesied in Isaiah 53 when he wrote, He shall bear their iniquities. He'll bear the sin of many. Jesus was fully paying the penalty for your sins, for my sins, and a great number that no man can calculate. Your sin indebted you to a holy God. Jesus paid that debt in full. His atonement was penal. He died a felon's death. Even though it crushed him and killed him, he bore them. The old hymn writer said, Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Now I want you to think about what some of the penal sufferings of Jesus were. Because when you think of these, every one of these sufferings is what should have fallen on you. And what will fall on the unrepentant. First of all, there was the physical pain. Multiple beatings at the hands of professional torture experts. We hear words like pierced, crushed, scourging. Sending the message that this was a horribly violent scene. This should have been you. Bearing the torment. And then there was the pain of being under a curse. Deuteronomy 21 says, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a cross. This was a a being humiliated to the lowest place, an outcast, a byword as men pass by. And then there was the emotional pain of human rejection. Isaiah would prophesy it. He was despised and rejected by men. Despised and we did not esteem him. The rejection was so great by men that men walked up to God the Son and spit in his face. It's what should have happened to you. Because Jesus was serving as your substitute. The greatest suffering was that of divine rejection. Jesus, near the end of his time on the cross, cries out in in agony the words of Psalm 22, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He was experiencing soul torment in the very depths of hell, which is what every lost person will bear. In those moments, the father would not console him. He was suffering what you should have suffered, the rejection of the father. And then he suffered the final penal blow, death. Because the penalty for sin against God is always death, Christ had to endure the death penalty. Paul says it this way, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus, by his suffering and death, satisfied every requirement of God's justice. It's vital to affirm that Jesus paid for all of the sins of his people, past, present, future. Omission and commission, huge sins and tiny sins. If he'd only borne some sins, 
Say, for example, just all past sins, but not all, you'd still be in need of a Savior. Was there any other way? Could, could any other way of salvation be found than a penal substitutionary atonement? The Bible answers with a resounding no. Hebrews 9 says, Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. When you look at the penal substitutionary atoning work of Christ, that is it. That's your only hope. Now Peter goes on and look at verse 24. He states something that ought to be very, very obvious. He states that, that those who have had such a glorious gift should live for righteousness. Peter is teaching now that we've been atoned for, we must be utterly alienated from our sins. Jesus' atoning work was to separate us from the power of sin in our lives. By his death, Jesus has set us free from the bondage to our sins so we're alive. Listen to Peter's fellow apostle, Paul, teach the same thing in Romans 6. Paul writes, how shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Knowing this, our old man was crucified with Jesus, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. Sin shall no longer have dominion over you. And what Peter's fellow apostle Paul is stating is that because Jesus has made a full penal substitutionary atonement for you, the power of sin has been broken in the believer. And we can no longer live under the power of life-dominating sins. Worry, gossip, fear, lust, hatred, pornography, substance addiction. Paul says their power has been broken by the death of Christ. Paul will go on and say, you're not your own. You were bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. Our salvation, you see, is not a theoretical doctrine. It's genuine deliverance from the enslaving, controlling power of sin. And what Peter's doing, look at those words in verse 24 when he says, having died to sins, we might live for righteousness. He's glorying in the cross and the work of Jesus, not only as the instrument of our justification, but no less as the instrument of our sanctification. There's a textual question that you need to deal with. You have friends, family members, I certainly do, who have taken this text and they've run headlong into great error. Look at the end of verse 24. When Peter writes, By whose stripes you were healed. This bears a little bit of explanation. When did Jesus receive stripes? We're told in John 19, so Pilate took Jesus and scourged him. The scourging was when Jesus received stripes. The scourge that John speaks of in John 19 was a leather whip that had sharpened pieces of metal and bone tied at the end of each strand of leather. Scourges had iron hooks tied at the ends. These were known as scorpions. And they were designed in the hand of a professional, professional torture artist to, as the scourge went into the back, the bare back of the sufferer. They were designed to dig into the flesh of the one being scourged and rip out skin and even organs. During scourging or receiving stripes, a person was stripped to the waist, tied to a post, flogged across the back and legs by Roman soldiers who relished their work. This brutal whipping would weaken the victim causing deep wounding, severe pain and bleeding, lacerations, swelling and bruising. Frequently, the victim would faint during the procedure. Sudden death was common. By the time the scourging was finished, the scourgee's back would be a bloody, raw pulp. When the Jews scourged a man, there was a limit. Forty lashes, said the law of God in Deuteronomy 25. So under Israelite justice, the court stopped at 39 lashes, but the Romans had no such maximum. And the soldiers who delivered the scourging, the stripes, were the army rangers of their day, highly trained in torture. This prophecy had been specifically prophesied in, in Psalm 129 when the psalmist wrote a thousand years before this, the plowers 
plowed my back and they made my furrows long. Jesus submitted to these stripes. That's why he says prophetically in Isaiah 50, I gave my back to those who struck me. In fact, Jesus prophesied this very incident in Matthew 20. Jesus said, Behold, we're going up to Jerusalem. The Son of Man will be betrayed and delivered to the Gentiles to mock him and to scourge him. This was no mistake, no surprise. Jesus was not caught off guard. He went to receive his stripes. And look at what Peter's doing here. Look at our text, the last few words of verse 24. By whose stripes you were healed. Peter is quoting Isaiah 53, 5. He was wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes or scourging we are healed. The stripes that wounded and killed Jesus cured us. Listen carefully. The stripes, the scourging that wounded Jesus and killed him, cured us. Jesus calls those who are sinners sick. The Messiah comes, we are told in Malachi 4, with healing in his wings. So Peter is asserting here at the last words of verse 24 that we are healed spiritually, judicially, eternally in the context by Christ's vicarious sufferings. Sin is pictured here as a a disease and is your greatest problem, not physical sickness. Sin is an abnormality, an intruder. It throws everything out of balance. It's infectious. Everyone catches this disease. Sin weakens and degrades men. Sin causes untold pain and anguish. Sin is always fatal. The wages of sin is death. One of the chief doctrinal assertions by our charismatic friends is that physical healing for physical ailments is what Jesus was doing in his atoning work. And if you aren't healed physically, then you must be faithless because you just need to claim your physical healing. My friend, let me state this categorically and bluntly. That is not the historic teaching of Protestantism, which is consistently asserted that it's not always God's will to physically heal. The Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy 5 couldn't heal Timothy's stomach problems. Paul couldn't heal Trophimus at Miletus or Epaphroditus. Paul speaks of a bodily illness he had. Are you going to say to Paul, Paul, if you had a little more faith in the atoning work of Jesus, you could be healed. God decreed Job's ailments. In none of these cases was it stated that these sicknesses were caused by sin or unbelief. They accepted their ailments and they trusted in God's grace to uphold them. John even said, or John writes that Jesus said in John 11, that sickness could be for the glory of God. There are numerous texts in scripture that assert that our physical bodies are constantly running down and suffering various ailments. Our bodies are said to be perishable and weak. Paul says our outer man is decaying. Death and disease will be part of the human condition until that time when we receive resurrection bodies that are immune to such frailties. How do we apply this text? Listen carefully. The first is, penal substitutionary atonement is the gospel. Paul says so in 1 Corinthians 15. Paul says, I declare to you the gospel which I preach, which you received and in which you stand. Christ died for our sins. What you've seen in verse 24, what you've heard from this pulpit today is the gospel. And therefore you're under obligation. You must do something with this gospel message. You must hard reject it. Or you must repent and believe in Christ the penal substitute. I would tell you what Jesus offers and gives all that come to him in repentance and faith is a full pardon. Pardon for yesterday's sin, pardon for today's sin, pardon for tomorrow's sin. If Jesus had not made a full atonement for sin, it would be of no help to you. And the gospel would not be good news, but awful news. Everything about Christ's salvation is full and complete. The law of God has brought you into complete condemnation. 
The justice of God has demanded a full payment for every transgression. The Holy Spirit has convinced you that you are completely bankrupt and without any merit or ability to pay. What happiness would it produce in you if I were to tell you this morning, Jesus has made a partial atonement for you. He's paid for all of your intentional sins. This would mock you. For you and I sin thoughtlessly a hundred times a day. Now the reason why the gospel of Christ is such good news is this. Jesus has made a full atonement for all of your sins of word and thought and deed and past and present and future and intentional and unintentional. This is the reason why we as Protestants still have a massive disagreement with Rome. Rome teaches a doctrine of purgatory, a place where partially redeemed men supposedly go to pay for some of their sins since the suffering of Jesus was insufficient to pay for it all. There was a place where all sins were paid for, but it's not purgatory. It was Calvary. If Jesus could pronounce his work of atonement finished, and he did, how foolish is it to add to it? Another important application you need to press home to your own conscience now. If you need a substitute, it shows that you're inadequate. When I played basketball for the Christian college where Sandy and I did our undergrad, I went into a, a dreadful shooting slump during the last few games of my junior season. And I remember that dreaded sound still wakes me up sometimes at night. The scorer's table horn blowing to signal that a substitute was coming in for me. At the beginning of the season, I had the hot hand. I would play the entire game and then my shooting began to drop off and I would get pulled after the first half. And then after the first quarter and the worse my play grew, the sooner I needed a substitute. I needed a substitute because I was inadequate. I think the actual phrase my coach used was, Carl, get over here, you're stinking it up out there. But the fact that you need a substitute says this, you are morally inadequate and deeply flawed. Have you come to grips with how desperately you and I need a perfect substitute before a holy God? That's what Christ the penal substitute supplies. I would say as well, the atonement addresses your greatest problem personally and the culture's greatest problem. Not global warming or terrorism or the economy or human trafficking. Your greatest problem and their greatest problem is that you have offended a holy God and broken his law and need to be made right with him. Then the Christian will pour his greatest energies into pointing men towards Christ as the answer to their needs and problems. But I think the most astounding application about the full penal substitutionary atonement of Jesus is this. That God will accept a substitute shows his astounding mercy and kindness. But that God will provide a substitute is a demonstration of love beyond compare. I'm still astounded at the mercy of God that he will even allow a substitute when I've personally offended him and defied him and broken his law times without number. But when I stop and meditate on this, that God supplied the substitute, never again will I think that he's harsh and demanding. No. Our God's care and concern for his elect is beyond comprehension. The great Scottish professor of the 1800s, John Duncan, known because of his expertise in the Old Testament as Rabbi Duncan, used to say to his students when he lectured on Isaiah 53, do you know what the cross was? It was damnation, and Jesus took it lovingly. Let's pray together. Our Father, how we praise you for your unspeakable love that long before eternity began, you decreed that your beloved and only Son would come and live a sinless life and die a cruel and painful and shameful death in our place. Lord, we pray this morning that you would help us to embrace the gospel with great joy. At the same time, we name our repentance 
expressing our faith in Jesus Christ. Lord, may we be as a congregation of the church who never is tempted to stray away from this gospel. We pray in the name of Jesus, our only substitute and Savior. Amen. Take your Trinity Psalter hymnals now and turn to hymn 287 as we stand and sing a most appropriate hymn, Lift High the Cross, hymn 287. encourage you to continue to join us for fellowship. Make your way down the hallway to the right. We'll have refreshments available for you there. Come back for our Sunday school classes. Again, the technology class will be here in the sanctuary. The biblical counseling issues will be in the choir room. Children will be in the youth room. And then come back tonight at 6 p.m. We will close out the Lord's Day in worship. Now receive the Lord's blessing, his benediction, his good word to you. Now may you grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.